All right, let's take a couple minutes to talk about what you're planning to do your project on. I have graded some of yours, the ones that were turned in as of whatever day it was last week uh, that I graded. Uh, let's just go around the room. Mike? Hey. Um, so my plan is to create a... It's a database based on user input, and its whole goal is to... Um, group people together who play the same games online um, based on the times that they play and how long they're willing to play and um, their attitude towards the play. So like um, maybe you want to be really competitive and you want a long-standing team so you can learn to play the game really well or maybe you just want to play you want to play on a team but you want to play it properly um, or maybe you just want to have a casual get together and you just want a team to play with. Um, but I'll have uh, five different popular multiplayer online games to, um, to kind of choose from and start from there. Um, each user will supply a couple of pieces of data, um, basically just what I talked about already, and then I'll have an algorithm or two to <coughs> pair these people based mostly on their times that are that they're available. Okay. So essentially, you have you have you have something um, um, to connect online gamers that would, would play together uh, based on a number of factors, including time and um, disposition, for lack of a better word. Yep. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Um, I'm doing a like a restaurant reservation system. Okay. So it's like an internal website that they're going to use. Okay. Someone calls in and they because the restaurant I work at we use like iPads to. Okay. There might be other people that were in the same boat. That's why. That's why we're doing this. All right. Um, I changed mine to. <clears throat> it's going to be a website um, for nonprofit organizations such as the Ghostbusters, and there um, it's going to show what events they're at and locations. So then um, people could go on there and see what what dates they're going to be at or what times the events, and then um, they can. Administrators on um, there can edit it if events are um, canceled or rescheduled. Okay, so essentially, it's a schedule for a nonprofit organization yes. or organizations. Right. I couldn't remember what you if you said one or multiple organizations. Yeah, it's just one. Okay, just one. All right. Um, an important thing to remember for those of you, and, and you're still thinking of yours, mm -hmm. right? All right. An important thing um, to keep in mind. Uh, about this is whatever problem you choose to solve, you don't have to solve every aspect that you can think of of the problem. So I'm not looking for a comprehensive um, solution. So, you know, if you're doing a restaurant site, for example, you know, handle reservations. You don't have to handle reservations and ordering of food and, and you know, prepare your financial statements and, and, and all that. You know, pick one problem that a hypothetical organization might have and, and try to solve it, all right? Or that users could have and, and, and try to solve it. So, you know, the online gaming thing was a good example, you know? I mean, there's, there's a lot of directions you could go with that. You could go with team rankings and all kinds of crazy stuff. But that's not what it's set aside to do. So, um, if you are, 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 are struggling with that, try to think small. All right. That, I guess that's my suggestion. Um, think small. And if you have an idea, run it past me. And if it's too big, there's always ways that you can sort of scrunch down a solution and just focus on one aspect of it. Uh, any questions? What, what are you looking at for your project? Um, I was doing we're looking at doing something kind of close to what I do for work as far as the spreadsheets and stuff like that. Kind of like a database to add. So there's like a, like a job schedule that I'm going to kind of do okay. with the calendar. And then you pull up records of different businesses and update it through the okay. website. Sounds good. Sounds good. So again, for those of you that are still thinking about that, um, 
my suggestion is um, try to decide fairly quickly, um, even if it's not the best idea. You know, try to come up with something. Um, and if you are still having questions or still having difficulties, we know we can talk about it. Let's talk about the next lab or two so we can get you moving in the right direction. Speaking of directions, I'm going to switch streams a little bit today and we're going to deal with another database. Uh, when I was thinking about preparing this lecture um, on the drive-in, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, no, I'm actually not just kidding because I knew what I was going to talk about, but I was still formulating my ideas in my mind. Um, well, I was thinking about it, uh, the database we're using uh, isn't well suited for what I'm going to try to demonstrate today. So we're going to come up with another database. All right, and you'll probably see uh, the, the reason for it when, when we get to a certain point um, in this. Um, well, one thing I do want to mention, by the way, any, uh, anyone that is interested in pursuing a bachelor's degree, uh, we do have a new partnership with the University of Akron for software and web development. Mm -hmm. And there is going to be a session tomorrow evening. Um, I am not 100% sure of the time. I would think six-ish but you can check in the business division if you're interested or talk to, uh, if you have another CIS prof, they, I'm not going to tomorrow, so I, I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head like the, the time, I think it's like six-ish, uh, but it's gonna be over in the College Center. So um, that's really exciting and, uh, and, and interesting. I just mentioned about the uh, University of Akron partnership uh, for software and web development and there is a uh, session tomorrow evening. I forget the time, but it's over in the College Center. Um, you could probably ch stop in the business division office down the street, down, down the street, <laughs> down the hall, and, uh, and find out exactly when. All right, here's the database we're going to deal with today. And I'll mention briefly why I want to do this database um, today, why we're, why we're switching, switching horses midstream. I want to do just a simple Database 101 example of a relationship. There weren't, there weren't the kinds of relationships I wanted to show something about today in the other database. So that's why we're going to this one. So we're just going to do a simple one where there's a customer, has of course a customer ID, customer name, sales rep ID, and a Boolean whether that says they're, whether they're a nonprofit customer or not. Now we could add all sorts of things to this, you know, address, phone number, blah, blah, blah. But the idea is if you, if you, if you can do it with this, you can extend it. You should be able to take and extend it. That's one thing that's important, and that's one thing specifically with the, that the project is meant to do, since, since we had mentioned the project before, is that we cover, um, you know, we can't cover, we can't possibly cover every single scenario and every single condition that you're apt to run into in a project. But hopefully we give you enough information that you can extend it. So if we talk about something here, um, we might not cover all the possibilities and all the permutations, but hopefully there's enough for you to be able to take that and build upon it and, and solve it. This will be related to a sales rep table. which of course will have a sales rep ID, a first name, and a last name. And this is a foreign key over here. One customer has one sales rep, one sales rep can have multiple customers, so we have a one to many relationship. <coughs> We're going to implement the foreign key, foreign key. And should we cascade deletes or not in this? You have a 50-50 chance. Just like the election today. We didn't do it, we uh, didn't do it this time. No. Would we do it this time? No, we would not cascade deletes. Why not? Okay, I, I think what you said is, uh, well, 
well, well, we only have these two tables, so we only need to worry about these two tables. But I, I think you hit the nail on the head. If we delete a sales rep, do we want to delete the customers associated with them? No, right? In other words, if John Smith is the sales rep for us and they get fired and we delete John Smith, do we want to delete all of John Smith's customers? Of course not. We'll assign another sales rep to them. So maybe after we get rid of, maybe after we've reassigned all of John Rep sales, uh, John Smith sales reps, then we can go and delete them. But remember, it always goes from the one to the many. If we delete this, do we want to delete that? A lot of people think think it goes the other way too. As far as cascading, no. You talks about deleting the parent. Do you want to delete the children? Do you want to delete the ones on the many side? And in this case, no. It doesn't really make sense to do that. Uh, in database terms, there are what are called independent and dependent relationships. All right. Um, think of a, 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 a an independent relationship um, where there are two entities whose existence don't depend on each other. All right. In other words, this customer may have been our customer long before we hired uh, uh, sales rep John Smith. Right. And they may still be our customer after we fire John Smith. All right? So their existence doesn't depend on John Smith being existent. Now, on the other hand, if you have something like, let's say, students and grades, for example, all right? If you delete a student, well, the grades depend on the student being there, right? It doesn't make sense to talk about, well, we have a grade for what student? Well, it's just a grade. Someone got an A plus, you know. That grade row in the database depends on the fact that there's a student there. It doesn't make sense to have one without the other. So I guess the question of, uh, um, of, of an independent versus dependent relationship is, if you can imagine having one without the other in a relationship, then it's independent. So yeah, we could have John Smith even if this customer goes to another, starts buying from another organization or goes out of business. And we can have this customer even if John Smith gets fired. All right, so that's an independent relationship. And in independent relationships, you don't cascade deletes. All right, because you don't want to take, take those out. So let's go ahead and quickly create this database and add a couple things to it. Tons of times creating the relationship because this is pretty straightforward and small. So let's create it in on the desktop. And let's call it sales. And we'll click create. So I'll go into design view on this. Customer is the name of the table. Customer ID is the auto number. Customer name. Should we make this required? Yeah, I would think so. Um, sales rep ID, which will be a number, and nonprofit, which will be a Boolean. Or a yes, no. Access is meant to be user friendly. They can't assume that, ev that everyone out there knows about George Boole and how he invented symbolic logic. And that's why we give tribute to him today by calling them Booleans. That's true, by the way. <laughs> now, I mean, why, I guess why would I make something like that up, you know? But, all right. Uh, let's create another table. 
and we'll go into design view and this is our sales rep table sales rep ID first name last name and we'll make both of these fields required All right, let's look at the customer table for a second. Let's look at sales rep ID. I don't have that required. Is that a problem? Because I'm about to make it a foreign key and I have it not required. Is that a problem? Um, maybe. All right. Well, maybe. I mean, I guess you could have you could have guessed that, right? Yeah, maybe it's a problem. Maybe not. Uh, it really depends on the organization. Um, it might be that we find a new a, a new customer at a, a convention. Let's say you know the, uh, every business has this convention where they go to and they try to get new customers. So maybe we get information that this customer is interested in buying us, and we want to enter them into the database. But maybe initially we don't know who their sales rep is. All right, we haven't assigned them yet. We'll come and do that later on. You know, the the sales manager will look to see exactly where they're located and and which of their sales rep has the least customers or whatever or who they think which sales rep do they think will work best with this customer or whatever criteria. And then later on they'll assign a, a sales rep. Um, so. You may not want to make that required if that's the situation. It would kind of be like a student that was enrolling in college that didn't have a major. Eventually, yeah, you're going to have a major, right? But the day that you go into the system, the day that you're initially enrolled, you may not know what you're, what you're going to major in. So therefore, you may not have a major. So therefore, uh, foreign keys can be no, all right? Uh, under certain circumstances. Another circumstance is if you had, let's say, a, uh, a database, a personnel database, where you had people and their spouses, right? Not every person has a spouse, right? So, therefore, you might not have a, a, a field filled in for spouse for a, a given person if that's how your database was designed. So, because it's a foreign key, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be required. There are some cases where there will never be, like, Someone may never be married and never have a spouse in there. There's other cases where maybe it will be blank at first and eventually it will get filled in. That's actually called, what is that called? I think they say um, becoming required or something like that where eventually it's going, to be, it's going to be required but it's not necessarily required initially. So we'll leave a blank. Just um, Actually we'll make it required. But again, we don't have to. The other thing we can do with foreign keys is we can specify whether they're, they're, they're unique or not. All right? And unique foreign keys are fairly rare. All right? Um, that would be when there's a one-to-one -one relationship between things. In this case, there's not, right? Because one sales rep can have many customers. So we will not make it unique. All right, so we should be all set. Let me go and put a couple, or let me go and create the foreign key, first of all. And then I'll put a couple of each in, and then we'll get into the .NET side of things. So let me go to Relationships. I'll pick both my tables. Enforce Referential Integrity, and I will not cascade delete. Now notice it tells me it's a one-to-many relationship, but if we were to look at the diagram I had up there, it would look exactly the same, other than the fact that they use a little infinity sign and we use the crow's feet. All right, so one-to-many. Uh, I've had students like ask me, well, it's supposed to be a one-to-many going in this direction, 
and yet the, the, it shows differently in access. Access doesn't get it wrong, all right? So if you have, if the relationship doesn't look the way that it should, then either you misunderstood the way the relationship is or you did something wrong. Maybe you put the foreign key in the wrong table and it needs to go the other way or something like that is a common problem. So you can't change that. Access automatically knows that this is the one side because that's the primary key of that table. And this is the many side because that's not the primary key to that table. All right? So um, access gets that right. And if it doesn't match up to your expectations, either you were mistaken in the way that it should be set up or you did something else wrong. Okay. And let's go in here and let's enter in a couple of people. And again, I'm not going to pay attention to the fact that like the pages that I'm creating today probably should be behind a login screen, right? You shouldn't be able to get into them unless you've logged in and you're administrator. I'm going to I'm going to assume that um, you know again we may come back to do that later on uh, or may not, but this is one of those things that you'd have to extend. You know, if this had to be, you would force them to log in and you would check their uh, attribute if they were administrator to make sure that they were an administrator before that they were allowed to access this page. So I'll go new website. We're going to use Visual C Sharp. We're going to use an empty website. We are going to put it on the desktop. And we are going to call it Sales website, for lack of a better name, doesn't exist, absolutely. Do we want to create it? Yes. Now again, I'm going to practice what I, what I preach. I'm going to do a little bit at a time, and I'm going to test it. I'm going to make sure it works. I'm going to do the next piece. Um, I can't emphasize enough how critical that is in, in coding. Every semester, I see people with gigantic pieces of code that they ask me to help them debug, all right, or, gig, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, I'm scratching my head looking at it because there's so much going on in it. Um, and, and, and they're trying to do too much at a time, all right. So we're going to do this in little pieces. I may, I'm going to go in and I'm going to allow um, um, displaying a, a grid of the customers. That's the first thing I'm going to do. Then I'm going to allow edits of the customers. All right? And so on. We'll do it incrementally. So what um, we're going to we're probably, depending on how fast it goes today, we're, we'll definitely revisit um, editing a, a grid view, and we'll probably get into editing a details view. All right. I want to put this in app data, my database. So I'm going to hopefully spell that folder name right. 
app underscore data, right? And I'm going to move my database in there. All right, I'm going to go and create a new page, new file. New web form. Place code in a separate file, C sharp. We're not going to play with master pages in this case. I'm going to click add. And away we go. So I'm going to go and drag over the two things we need, a SQL data source and a grid view. And then we'll bind them. So I'll drag my grid view over. I'll drag my SQL data source over. All right, configure SQL data source. All right, database connection. I'll click new connection. Oh, I lied. I'm going to go here and hit refresh. How did I know to do that? Because I didn't see the database on my list of when I when I click the uh, drop down there. Now when I go into here and click configure data source, there I see my database. So that's how I knew that I forgot to do something. So I'll pick that next. I'm going to save it as my connection string. Or I always hate my this my that sales connection string and now I'm going to go home I hope you enjoyed class today please drive safely I, I seem to notice that pattern. Yes, yes, I do. Let's look at the web config file, by the way, and see if it actually created that. Did it create it and die, or did it uh, did it um, die before it created it? It looks like it died before it created it. And that's important to know, right? Because if it already created it, it would do something else. All right, let's go back here. Oh, it, I it didn't even save my... Uh, I, I had not saved the um, default page, so I have to recreate those things anyhow. All right, so grid view. And... SQL data source, configure data source, save as sales connection string. All right, so I'm going to, I'm going to do the, the, um, the, the, the easier way, and I'm just going to pick and say from the customers table, I want these things. All right. As opposed to typing in the SQL statement by hand. One observation I've had, uh, in general, if you're doing maintenance on a table, that is if you're doing inserts, updates, and deletes, it works far better if you're only working on one table. So you might think, for example, for sales rep, I should do a join to the sales rep table to get the sales rep name. Well, that sounds like a good idea, but it's not necessarily. 
is that makes the updating more confusing and, and you, would, you will typically have to do more work to straighten out the updates, inserts and deletes. So to make sure that it knows the right table to do it. So when I do these, I do these strictly with that. How are we going to then? Are we going to always display the sales rep number? No, we're going to address that in another way. And we'll see how we're going to do that in a few minutes here. So, next, test query. All right, looks fine. And finish. Now we're going to bind this to that. We certainly should go in and clean this up. In other words, you know, maybe make the, um, the, the column titles more descriptive, whatever. But again, I'm assuming you know how to do that, and in the interest of time, I won't. So let's go and debug this. change to make this updatable. Well, there's two things on the page. Do we have to change the grid view? Yes. We have to tell it that it's okay to update this. Do we have do we have to change the um, SQL data source? Yes, we have to supply the update statement for that. So let's go in and let's configure data source. And I'm going to go in and I can click this, generate insert, update, and delete. And yeah, might as well. So I generated the insert, update, and delete. That might make you nervous. It makes me nervous when something does something for me and I, I can't see what it does. So if I go back in this again, I still can't see it. Well, I can see it if I go to the code view. If I go to the code view, I will see the insert statement is insert update and delete statement are part of this. There's the delete command. Delete from customer or customer ID equals question mark. Does that sound right? Sure. Insert command. Insert customer. Insert into customer. Customer ID. Customer name. Sales rep ID. Nonprofit. Does that look correct? Actually not. What looks incorrect about that SQL statement? It's like, the, it's like a couple days before payday, so I don't have any money to spare. But I'd almost be willing to offer money on this one. Because this is subtle. What's wrong with this insert statement? Insert in the customer, customer ID, customer name, sales rep ID, and nonprofit. No? Wasn't customer auto number? Customer ID is an auto number. Exactly. Therefore, we're not going to specify it. We're going to let the database specify it. So I have to get rid of that there. I have to get rid of the corresponding question mark here. And here where it has the insert parameters, I have to get rid of that there. Now, we wouldn't have noticed that because you can't do inserts into a grid view. I just want to get you in the habit 
of just because the code is generated for you, don't accept it as being correct. I mean, I would consider that a bug. Uh, it should be smart enough to know that that's an auto number field and that you don't insert it manually. But hey, it's your project, right? You're the person who has to complete this. ASP.NET Framework and Visual Studio is just trying its best to try to help you. And if it doesn't do it right, well, it's still your responsibility to make it right. Let's look at the update statement then. Update command. Update, set, customer, num customer name equals that, sales rep ID equals that. That looks correct. And if we look here, the right number of parameters. So everything else appears like it should be correct. So, yes? So you leave the customer ID in that one? Yeah, you leave the customer ID in that one because remember, the customer ID is needed in the update statement. It is not used, it's not going to be updated, but it's needed to select the right row to update. All right? So if you look where the customer ID gets put in the update statement, it gets put in not as one of the sets. We're not setting the customer ID equal to something. We're including it in the where clause. So that's the difference. We're not supplying a value for it um, through our grid view. We are using a value to update the correct row. All right. Last thing we have to be able to do is we have to say that we are going to enable editing and enable deleting. Notice again that enabling uh, inserting isn't an option here. All right. Why not? Well, because it's a grid view. You can't update or I'm sorry, you can't insert on a grid view. All right, so let's go and run this. I click edit. I get the default behavior. All right, so far we're working on the default behavior. And remember, we had the whole discussion about like, this is what the framework does. You can either take it, either it works for you 100%, which is not always going to be very likely. It might work for you 70%. Um, or you take it and massage it a little bit to get it to work for you 100%, which we'll look at doing here because there's still there's clearly a few problems here that we'll look at. Or you just write it yourself. All right? you, can write your, you can always write your own code. So what do you suppose the problems are here? I click edit. By default, anything that I'm allowed to edit becomes either a text box or some other control. Because this is a Boolean, it became a checkbox. But these other two things became just plain old text boxes. I see at least two problems here. Problem number one. There's nothing in the framework that defaults uh, to some kind of validation. So if I eliminate the customer name and click update, it's going to blow up because you have to have a customer field. The other problem is this is a text box for a foreign key. Well, what does that mean? Well, I would have to have memorized all the sales reps and their sales rep number. And if I put in an invalid sales rep ID, same thing. I get an error. Now, remember there's always a couple things we can do with errors, right? Thing number one that we can do with errors is that we can let the errors happen and simply display a user-friendly error message. That's what we did last time, if I remember right. We, we put code in the row deleted event, I think, of the grid view. And we looked for an exception. And if there was an exception, we, we popped up an error message. And that's still a good idea to do. Because these are two problems that I thought of off the top of my head. Because I've worked with grid views before and I understand how they work. But there could be other problems as well, right? And there's always the, the, the 
completely situational, bizarre problems of what if the database crashed right prior to doing an update, all right? Or someone locks a table prior to doing an update. Something you can't possibly predict or foresee, but you know that those kinds of errors are possible. So one thing that we can do is we can report the errors more gracefully, all right? So we're going to do that. That's what we did last week, and we're going to do that. And um, then we'll move on to, to step B, which is error prevention. It's much better to prevent an error than to let the error happen and simply tell a person nicely that an error occurred. All right? Telling someone nicely that an error occurred is better than telling someone rudely that an error occurred. All right? But being able to prevent the error altogether is better still. So, what I'm going to do is this. Let's first of all make sure that the update works. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to type Mike Zellers Inc. and click update, and yeah, it works. Okay, so yay. It works if, if I behave correctly and don't enter any goofy data in. All right, now I'm going to go in here. I'm going to go on my grid view, and I'm going to say, on row deleted equals, and I'm going to click create a new event. Grid view one, row deleted. So I look at my code behind. There it is. I'm going to need a, uh, a label for an error, so I'm going to go and I'm going to put a label for my error. I may follow your advice of closing and reopening it. See if that works. in it, and I'll call it label air. So do we remember what we did last time with the air processing? This event is going to fire off after the row gets deleted. I should say after, and I did this wrong. I don't want row deleted, I want row update. All right, so I'm gonna go and delete this. after they've attempted to update the row, all right? And this event's going to happen after the row has been updated, and that update could either be successful or not successful. We know if it's successful or not based on this. 
this is the police report of what happened in the update. All right. This contains all the information about actually what happened in the update. And specifically, this, uh, this grid view updated events args is a class that can, uh, and, and the ob specific object we're getting is called E, and one of the attributes is an exception object. So we're going to see if that exception object is null or not. All right? If it's null, that means that everything went okay. There's no errors. If it's not null, then we know that there was an error. So I can say if e dot exception not equal to null, then I can put something in the air, text box, or label rather, Attempt to explain the possibilities here. And then we have to tell the .NET framework that we got this, that we handled the error, all that's going to be handled. Now remember, we're simply displaying a label on a text box. We can also write to a log file. All right, we could create a file and write to a file saying that this error occurred at this time. That would be useful in troubleshooting. You would periodically look at that log file and see, gee, are we getting the same error over and over again? If so, let's look into maybe what's causing that error. So the way that we tell the .NET framework that we handle the exceptions, we set exception handled equal to true. If we say, because if there's an exception, someone has to handle it. And someone in this case is one of two entities. It's either us, the developer, or it's the .NET framework. All right? So if we handle it, we have to tell the .NET framework that we've taken care of this error. You don't need to do anything. And that's what this does. So let's run this through debug again. And we should at the very least get user-friendly error messages. So if I go in here and edit this, and put in some bogus number for that and click update. <laughs> Finally, we get the error message. Now again, it's not a particularly good error message. You know, I would word that better. All right. But at least, at least it's better than the big, ugly ASP.NET error message. Now again, this kind of trap, error trapping is good for the errors that we can't expect. But some of the errors we can actually prevent from happening. All right? For example... You spelled sales rep wrong. Pardon me? You spelled sales rep wrong in the error. Yeah, that's probably the least of my problems on this. Maybe fields missing or no sales app. Or DB crashed. Yeah, I would I would reward that. The two errors that I could anticipate are this. What if they leave the sales rep? Uh, what if they put in an invalid number for a sales rep? Or what if they leave the customer number blank? How can we address those things? Yes? Could you have a drop box for Okay. For the sales rep, we could use a drop down. Absolutely. Alright? So that's how we can address the sales rep. Then 
Well, they'd have to pick someone that's on the list. They wouldn't have the ability to type in just anything. So that's how we can prevent that error from happening. I hesitate to use the word prevent because there really could be flukes. Like just as I, I, could, I could pick a person from the drop down, get a phone call, talk to that. In the meantime, someone goes into the database and deletes that sales rep, hang up and I click update and I get the error because it was there to create the drop down but it wasn't there when I went to save it. Yeah, those are flukes, but remember, we got our air trapping and our try-catch to handle those kind of fluke situations. All right? So that will handle that one. How can we handle there being no customer name? Required field. Yeah, we'll make a required field. We can use a required field validator. All right? Now, there's a teensy problem with that, all right, is that these controls are not standalone controls on our form, but these controls are part of a grid view. And a grid view changes depending on what mode it's in. should clear out that error message too at some point, but um, we'll do that next round. So right now, we don't want that to be a drop down because we don't want them to choose that. And this isn't a text box. So the text box and a drop down only exist under certain conditions. All right. So we can't do what we've normally done. How do we handle that? Well, in ASP.NET, there's something called a template field. This is the default behavior of the grid view. Labels or text boxes, depending on whether we are editing it or not. No validation. What we have to do is we have to go in and we have to tweak or massage the default framework. Fortunately, the kinds of things that we need to do in this case are, are pretty easy to do. All right? So we should be able to, should be able to um, handle this. All right? I think this will take care of it. Let me go in and put. This should blank it out. All right. So I'm going to go to my grid view. And I'm going to click Edit Columns. And I'm going to look at my customer name. And I'm going to say convert this field into a template field. There's a link down there. What does that mean, convert it to a template field? What that means is this, that we don't want the default behavior for this. We want to write our own, we want to handle this our own way. We don't want the default behavior. We want something different than the default behavior. What's the default behavior? Text boxes and no validation for the most part, other than the checkbox, right? The checkbox for the Boolean. That's the one exception for it. But for everything that isn't a Boolean, the default behavior is text boxes and no validation. Well, in one case we don't want a text box, and in another case we don't want a validation. So I'm going to first off, I'm going to create customer name. I'm going to say convert this field into a template field. So I click that. And I'm going to do one at a time. I'm first going to add the validation, then I'm going to go and make a drop down. And I click OK. All right. So far, nothing has changed. We've just told the grid view that we're going to put some code in on our own. I click on Edit Templates, and what I see is I see all of my template fields, all the things I've defined as templates. Right now, I've only defined one template. I've defined a customer name. All right. 
I have to find a customer name. And the customer name, um, do, 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 um, the item template is the default when it's in read-only mode. And so the item template for the customer name is a plain old label. And that's fine, right? Label works fine if we're read-only. I have an alternating item template. So I could like stagger things if I wanted to like alternate the items, make it easier to read. I have an edit item template. All right, that's the one that I'm interested in. This is what is going to happen when I go into update mode for this, when I go into edit mode for this. So I click edit item template and I get a text box, right? Why do I get a text box? Well, because that's what happens when you go into edit mode. We'll try this again. Save all. And I'm going to close this. Because my toolbox isn't coming up. And I'll go in it again. All right, so I will go again into Edit Template. I will go into the Edit Item Template, and I will drag over a Required Field Validator. I'm not going to drag it over here. I'm going to drag it actually into the template cell. to pick that and I can configure the error message say must enter a name I can set the control to validate which will be text box one all right you have to do this little template thing because remember that text box isn't always on your page that text box only exists under certain circumstances so I can't go in and put the validation control on the page like I did in the other examples because this text box is embedded within the grid view and because it's embedded in the grid view it doesn't always exist all right it only exists when you're in edit mode so now I go and run this and
this point I usually start making patterns with the cursor. Like look, look at the wheel going. What do you mean a name that doesn't exist? That someone wants to edit it and they spell Zeller's wrong or they Oh yeah, there's no way that you could do that. There's okay. there's no way that you could you could keep, stop those kind of errors. Like okay. like the like this customer is um, Zeller's Incorporated. Ha, ah, just kidding, it's Ford Motor Company. There's no way you can validate for that, right? I mean that's impossible. But you can you can validate for um, mechanical things like is there something in the field or 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 whatever. Because I was thinking maybe like um, you know how you would start it would search it for you like you start typing let's say um, Zellers and you start C E L oh, it automatically fired up. But how how would you possibly know the name of all the companies in the world to do that? You could do that if you were looking up something in your database, yes. but again, you know, this isn't looking up something in the database. This is going in and editing the name that was en was entered in. Okay. You know, en entering the name of a company or editing the name of a company. Okay. Did we blow up on something? Now we could put controls in to keep it from allowing us to enter the same company name twice. Um, what we would do is we would make a, uh, a unique index on the name, and that would keep me from having two Ford Motor Companies. All right, I did not do that, but you you could you could do that. That would be one way to improve the validation a little bit. So I click at it. and even the hard one. All right. So, if I were to try to save without a customer name and click update, Oh, yeah. 
there's that. Remember we did this way back at the beginning of the semester or something. We had it to add to the web config file. No, I have like 50 tabs open. <laughs> It's ridiculous. You know how bet it is. I will bet is that stupid warning that tells you that you're not allowed to, you know, do illegal things on the computer um, that pops up. Because I haven't gotten to that message yet on any of my 58 browser windows that I tried to open. <laughs> it's a uh, it's the wall. It's the wall? Yeah, exactly. Um, so we'll try this another day. Um, I will...
reboot this, but I want to get this example. I don't want to um, start from scratch. Like close, then die. At this point, let me mention that I do not recall ever having a problem like this on my Mac. 